Discord. Is it recording? Yes, it is. Okay. So today we're talking about calorimetry. This is going on exam three. Okay. Calorimetry will be um, subject for this week's lab, as well as what we're talking about all week in lecture. And so we need to talk about by first defining some terms. Okay, the first term we need to talk about is enthalpy, which we represent with lowercase q. I don't use uppercase q. Next semester in Chem 2, we'll use uppercase q as the reaction quotient, which is something extremely different. Okay, so enthalpy we represent with lowercase q. All right? And enthalpy is just another word for heat. Okay? It's just energy that's used to increase the temperature of an object. Right? So if I take my beaker of water, place it over the Bunsen burner, crank it up, right? I'm applying energy. The energy that's being used to increase temperature is what we specifically refer to as heat. Okay? And the word we use for that is enthalpy. Represent that with lowercase q. So don't get thrown off by the name enthalpy. Okay? It sounds a lot scarier than it is. And so just like mass is conserved, energy is conserved too, right? We talked about the law of conservation of mass way back at the beginning of the semester. The law of conservation of energy states exactly the same thing, that energy, just like mass, is never created or destroyed. It's transferred from one source to another, right? So if I take hot water and I pour it into my cold water, heat is transferred from the hot to the cold, right? Or from one source to another source, one type of energy. Um, one type of energy could be kinetic energy, right? And I'm turning that energy into um, thermal energy, right? Different types of energy transfer, all allowed, just like mass transfers allowed. We need to talk about system and surroundings, okay? The system would be the molecules that we're interested in, and the surroundings would be everything else, okay? So the molecules of interest, we call those the system, and then everything around the system, we call the surroundings, <clears throat> system and surroundings. Because when we're talking about energy, we're gonna need to focus our attention to certain molecules, right? Because we can't study the entire universe at once. That's not possible. Right? We're gonna be doing calculations for very specific molecules. The ones that we're looking at in our beaker, for instance, would be our system. And then everything surrounding that system here will be the surroundings. Now there are three types of systems, open, closed, and isolated, okay? So let's talk about what those mean. I'm gonna do some sketching here. All right, so a completely open system would be one where there's no interface between the system and the surroundings. All right, so if I've got my beaker, and I got hot water in it, right? There's my system, here's the surroundings, Right? There's nothing separating the system from the surroundings. So in other words, if this is hot water, is there anything stopping that hot water, that heat, from leaving the system and going into the surroundings? Is there any sort of barrier? No, right? So that heat, that heat transfers out in all directions, right? That's an open system. There's no barrier. There's nothing stopping that heat from escaping. Likewise, there's also nothing stopping heat from coming in, right? So if the system was colder than the surroundings, right? There's nothing stopping heat from coming in, there's nothing stopping heat from going out. So obviously, would this be an ideal situation for conducting thermal experiments? No, right, it's way too, way too uh, open, <laughs> to use the word to just define it, right? They're just, there's just too much variability. Because if the temperature goes up, or if the temperature goes down, I don't know where it came from, right? Was it because heat came out or heat came in? I don't know, right? This is obviously, not ideal for some sort of lab, right? Now, a closed system means that the system is completely separated from the surroundings, right? So here's the surroundings. All right, now a closed system has extreme barriers, right? So for instance, a bomb calorimeter is a good example of a, as close as you would get in a lab setting in the undergraduate level at least. Okay, so we'll talk about bomb calorimeters later, but a bomb calorimeter is a nice example of something that you could see in your first year chemistry experiences. Right, so this is a metal and then there's usually layers of water. There's lots of layers separating here. 
right? So we're, we're doing our very, very best. Right, so you've got layers here. We're doing our very, very, very best to keep all the heat or inside here and no influence from the surroundings, right? Now, is this something real practical for everyday experiments? Probably not, right? Because bomb calorimeters are really expensive. So what we use is an isolated system, right? So an isolated system, the ones that we use, calorimeters we use, are actually made out of styrofoam, right? So we've got our system here. And then we've got styrofoam, which is obviously not metal and layers of water and all sorts of other stuff, right? This is styrofoam. So it keeps, it keeps heat in, it keeps, it prevents heat from coming in from the surroundings, but is it as closed as the bomb calorimeter? No, right? So the ones we'll be using are isolated, called a coffee cup calorimeter. That's what we'll be using. We define those as isolated systems, okay? Because there is still influence from the surroundings. There is still heat loss to the surroundings, but it's not this open system, which would just be a beaker sitting out, and it's not a bomb calorimeter either. So it's a nice, it's a nice budget-friendly option here for us, which we call an isolated system. So that's what we'll be working with in our lab that we do. All right, let's talk about exothermic and endothermic, two vocab words you may be familiar with already. So if Q is positive, we have a positive value of Q, that means that heat is entering the system, right? So heat is coming in from the surroundings, and that's called endothermic, endothermic, right? You could think of it N, E-N kind of sounds like in, like go in, or N, like enter. And then if Q is negative, that means he is leaving the system. So exothermic, right? X, like exit. Right? So Q is positive, it's endothermic. Enter, right? Endothermic. Negative Q, heat is leaving. Exothermic, exiting, right? So we need to make sure we understand which vocab word goes with which value of Q, right? Positive Q is endothermic. Negative Q is exothermic. And we're going to be doing lots of calculations of Q. So looking at the sign of Q is going to be really important to us. Okay, positive Q, endothermic, negative Q, exothermic. Again, make sure you're using lowercase Q here. Uppercase Q means something entirely different. It's called the reaction quotient, which we'll deal with next semester in Chem 2. Okay, now. We're gonna do two different types of calculations this week. Anytime we change either the temperature or the phase, there's a cost in energy, okay? Changing temperature or changing phase costs us something. We have to pay for that in energy. Now, if we're increasing it, we're paying for it. If we're decreasing it, we're getting it back, right? So one's a refund, one's money going in. But nonetheless, changing the temperature, or changing the phase. The calculations are different, okay? The calculation we use for a temperature change is different than the calculation we'll do for a phase change. So you need to be really careful in looking at the problem and asking yourself, okay, am I changing temperature or am I changing phase? Because calculations for temperature changes are different than calculations for phase changes. Okay, so make sure you understand the difference there. So let's look at changing temperature first. We're going to deal with just changing temperature first. So we're not changing phase, we're only changing temperature. So we need to talk about the heat capacity, which we represent with lowercase c. Okay, this is the amount of heat required to raise one gram by one degree Celsius. One gram by one degree Celsius. Okay, it has units, units look kind of funny, joules per gram degree Celsius, right? That dot just means times. Okay, so it'd be joules on the top, grams times degrees Celsius on the bottom. Okay, so this is how much energy in joules it's taking to raise one gram by one degree Celsius. Right, so you hear that word thrown around a lot, and you're going to see it in our calculations. Now, heat varies. Heat capacity is going to be a function of substance. Each substance is going to have its own heat capacity. Okay, the heat capacity is not a constant for everything. It, going to be unique to each substance. So, 
for instance, there's liquid water. There's ethylene glycol, that's antifreeze, that's what's in antifreeze. There's aluminum metal. Look at this, you can go try this for yourself. I mean, you need to practice some prudence when you do this. But if you take a piece of aluminum and you put it in your oven, oven you crank it up, you can let it get really, really hot. You take it out wearing gloves, obviously, but if it sits on the counter for just a few seconds, it gets cold, it gets cold to touch immediately. You can't do that with water, liquid water that's come straight out of the oven, right? You, took, you stick your finger in, you know, liquid that's come straight out of the oven, it's gonna burn. But aluminum's got such a low heat capacity, after a few seconds out of the oven, um, you can actually touch it. Glass, right? So let's do some, some thinking here. This is a cup of water, this is a bathtub of water. Which one of them has the greater heat capacity? Be careful about this. This is liquid water, this is liquid water. They're gonna have the same heat capacity. But the question that gets the most students in trouble, which one requires the most heat to raise the temperature? That's where it's different, right? The heat capacity of liquid water is gonna be the same, no matter what the quantity is. But how much energy would I need to put in to raise the temperature of a cup of water versus a whole bathtub of water. Well, obviously the bathtub is going to take more energy, right? Because it's got a greater mass. But the heat capacity between the two is the same. So our calculations need to factor in not only identity of the substance, but also how much of it, right? Because raising the cup, raising the temperature of this cup of water is going to take less energy than raising the temperature of this bathtub full of water. All right. And like I said, you can have the same substance have different heat capacities just based on state of matter. Okay, H2O, here are its three heat capacities. I'm gonna give you a handout. Um, it's in your textbook as well with heat capacities. It'll be on your reference page on your next exam. Okay, I'm not gonna make you memorize heat capacities, but I do want you to know that you need to look at the state of matter, okay? Because heat capacity for solid versus liquid versus gas are gonna be very different. Okay, so just get in the habit of not only looking up identity, but also state of matter. So here's the formula. Again, this is for temperature changing, not phase changing. Q equals MC delta T. Right, so this X just means times. M times C times delta T. Q is enthalpy. Now this could be joules or kilojoules. Watch those units carefully. M is mass in grams. I say be careful here because what if mass was given to you in kilograms? What if you were given moles? Right, make sure it's mass in grams. Heat capacity, that's unique to each substance, both its identity and its state of matter. And delta T, remember delta means change in, and change in is always final minus initial. Final minus initial, always, always, always. We're doing delta S, delta G, delta H, delta T, delta Q, whatever, right? Delta is always final minus initial. That's important because delta T could be negative and if you have a negative, that's okay. Don't drop a negative, right? Because if you're carrying a negative Q, that, interpret, that changes the way you would interpret this, right? So if delta T comes out to be negative, do not drop that negative sign, okay? Make sure you keep any negatives you get. Because remember, the sign of Q is big for us in terms of how we interpret that data. So Q equals MC delta T. Um, I know, I don't think anyone in here, is anyone here pre-med? No one here is pre-med. Well, you can think about someone you know who's pre-med. People who are gonna be medical doctors, they're gonna have to take the MCAT, Medical College Admissions Test. So it looks like M-C-A-T, right? M-C, Delta. If you're gonna go to pharmacy school, you'll take an admissions test for pharmacy school. If you're going to graduate school, you'll take one for graduate school. Right, one for med school is called the MCAT, M-C, Delta, T. So it kind of looks like that. Now again, remember, positive Q means heat is entering. That's endothermic. Negative Q, oops, left off the E, leaves, leaves the object. It's cooling off. Now, I have to say this about a thousand times because it's so important that you understand. When you're using Q equals MC delta T, are you changing phases? You're not melting, okay? You're not boiling, you're not condensing, you're not anything. This phase is staying the same. Solid is just being heated up, okay? Please make sure you note to yourself that this is the formula we use when we're changing temperature only 
We're not changing state. Let's do this one together. Calculate the enthalpy change when the temperature of 0.78 kilograms of water changes from 18 to 23 degrees Celsius. Heat capacity of water is 4.18. And so the first thing we do is we want to calculate delta T, right? It is always, 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 always final minus initial. Okay, please make note of that. It's not just the difference, okay? It is final minus initial, meaning if you generate a negative, you're gonna carry that negative with you. So the final was 23, the initial was 18, so this one does end up being positive. But remember, the way the problem's worded, it could end up being negative, okay? So watch that sign notation really carefully. Now we're just going to calculate. Now notice, why did I change 0.78 kilograms to 780 grams? Right, the units need to match. If this were in kilograms, then this would not cancel out, right? Grams cancel, degrees Celsius cancel. That gives me a unit of joules here. Right, so 1,006, oh, excuse me, 16,317.6 joules. Now obviously I'll then need to round that to sig figs, right? So rounding that to two significant figures would be 1.6 times 10 to the fourth joules. If you wanted to convert that to kilojoules to make it a smaller number, you certainly could, right? 1.6 times 10 to the fourth joules is the same thing as 16 kilojoules. That's why I say the units can be joules or kilojoules. You get some ginormous number in joules, you wanna make that number smaller, you can turn it into kilojoules, that's fine. Is everybody cool on how we do this? Okay, now this is an object that's heating up, which you could intuitively figure out, right? If the temperature goes up, it's getting hotter, right? You do this one. Calculate the enthalpy change when the temperature of 0 0.830 kilograms of water changes from 24 to 87 degrees Celsius, and there's the heat capacity of water in the liquid phase. Pause the recording here. All right, so this is a temperature change, not a phase change, right? Q equals MC delta T. So we're calculating the delta T, final minus initial, and we're plugging into our equation. How many sig figs are we keeping? Three sig figs, right? So 2.19 times 10 to the fifth, if you're keeping it in joules, or 219 kilojoules. I'll accept either format, whichever makes you happy. Is everybody good on how we did this? Q equals MC delta T. Like I said, we're taking a break from stoichiometry for a while. Woo so we're gonna be we're changing gears, talking about energy for a little while. Do this one. Calculate the enthalpy change when the temperature of 0.83 kilograms of ice changes from zero to negative two. The capacity of ice is 2.03. Pause the recording. So these calculations are pretty easy, right? Everybody's usually pretty happy on this day because it's like, yeah, these calculations aren't too bad. As long as you remember final minus initial, right? The final temperature is negative two and the initial temperature is zero. So this generates a negative, which we then need to carry with us. We have three significant figures. Do we agree? Yes. Getting colder. Now, we're gonna do something in lab this week. You are gonna set the parameters for this experiment, where you're gonna determine the heat capacity of something experimentally, compare it to the known value. Right? That's what you're doing this week in lab, you're writing that procedure, and I think after today, you'll be more prepared to do that. So calorimetry is the study of heat flow during chemical and physical changes, right? So if we're changing temperature, um, if we have a chemical reaction taking place, calorimetry is the study of the heat during that process. And we're going to be using a coffee cup calorimeter. Is that open system, closed system, or isolated system? That one's isolated, right? So we're going to be using styrofoam cups with a nice snug fitting lid um, with a way for us to keep it moving, right? So we're going to keep it stirring, and then we'll have our uh, thermometer measuring in there so we're not opening and closing the lid right, to let out all our heat. And so the system, the system is whatever we add to the water. Okay, water is part of this setup. Okay, so water is part of the setup. The system is anything that we add to it. So a piece of metal or a temperature, different water, right? 
and then the surroundings is the water in the calorimeter. Okay, so that way we've got a very defined system. We've got a very defined surroundings. Okay, just the liquid water is the surroundings, and then anything we add to it will be the system. So if something's exothermic, the system will lose heat, and the surroundings will gain that heat, right? Because the law of conservation of energy is saying energy is going to be transferred from one to the other. And so that means one's going to be negative, one's going to be positive. System will be negative, the surroundings will be positive, if this is an exothermic process, right? If this is something where heat's being exiting the system, right? Exiting the system, so negative. The, the value of negative Q will be equal to the positive Q of the surroundings. So that means we can say, okay, if Q is equal to MC delta T, then I can substitute negative M water, C water, delta T water, if my system is, say, hot water, and my surroundings would be, you know, room temperature water, and water, sea water, delta T of the bottom of the water. Or hot bar, or whatever you want to use as your system. So let's do this one together. This is where we have to start thinking a little bit more. A 100 gram metal pellet, originally at 88.4 degrees Celsius, is dropped into 125 milliliters of water, originally at 25.1 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of both the metal pellet and the water is 31.3 degrees Celsius. What is the heat capacity of the pellet? So this is what you're gonna be doing in lab this week. You're gonna be choosing your parameters. You're gonna be choosing what substance you're gonna be searching for the heat capacity of. So I've got a whole bunch of metals you can use. You can also use water. You decide that, it's completely your, your um, discretion. But you'll be choosing your quantities and your temperatures and all that good stuff. So let's go through this one together. Now the best way to keep everything organized is by listing. Listing out variables is gonna save you a lot of headache here because there's a lot of numbers on this screen, right? 188, 125, 25, 31. There's a lot of numbers on the page here. So what I really recommend doing is making yourself a two column table. One for the system, one for the surroundings. Okay, because if you keep everything organized, you're less likely to make a silly mistake. So the water is the surroundings, the pellet is our system. We first need to define who's who there, right? The water is our surroundings, the metal pellet, we don't care what its identity is here because that's what we're solving for, is the system. And so that means that the water's gonna gain heat and the metal's gonna lose heat, right? Positive Q of the surroundings is equal to negative Q of the system. So let's make ourselves a table, right? There's mass of water times heat capacity of water times the delta T of the water is equal to negative mass of the metal times heat capacity of the metal times delta T of the metal. So here's what I recommend. Make yourself two columns, okay, so that all these numbers get organized in a meaningful way. The problem told us that the mass of the water was 125 grams, right, because it was 125 milliliters. Density of water is one gram per milliliter. So if it's 125 milliliters, that means its mass is 125 grams. And we're told that the metal pellet has a mass of 100 grams. Heat capacity of water in the liquid phase is 4.184. We don't know what the heat capacity of the metal is. That's what we're solving for. That's what we're trying to find out. Delta T. Delta T, the problem told us that the final temperature of the water is 31, the initial temperature is 25. For the metal, problem told us the final temperature is 31, initial temperature is 88.4, right? Notice this, the final temperature of both of these is the same, because the final temperature of both the water and the metal are gonna be the same. They're at thermal equilibrium, right? The metal and the water are at the same final temperature. It's called thermal equilibrium. So this is why I recommend making a two column table. And now you're just plugging into this, right? You're just plugging all this information in up here and doing some algebra. And it's not even complicated algebra, right? It's just regular everyday algebra. But <clears throat> because the arithmetic isn't difficult, the difficult part is organizing your information. Okay, so organize your information. I say make two columns. Whatever works for you, obviously, if a flow chart works better for you, then do what works for you. So we're just plugging and chugging now. So if the gain of one is equal to the loss of the other, 
Then now we're just plugging in our variables, right? 125 times 4.184 times 6.2 is equal to negative. Keep, don't, keep in mind, there is a negative here, right? That's built in. That is built in 100 times C times negative 57. So then when we do some arithmetic, don't forget, a negative times a negative would give me a positive, right? So this times this times this gives me 3242.6. This times this, two negatives would give me a positive times C. Therefore, C is 0 0.567. Once you know the heat capacity, you can identify it, right? Because each substance will have its own unique heat capacity. Now in lab this week, you get to decide what substance you are figuring out the heat capacity for. Like I said, I've got a big long list of metals, aluminum, copper, a whole bunch of them. Um, you could also be figuring out the heat capacity of water. These all have knowns, right? So you can look up the known value, compare yours to the known value, and it'll be a nice assessment of how well you did. But this is what you're doing in lab. You are making your own experiment, so you need to define masses, temperatures, quantities, the whole works. You try this one. 55.9 gram metal pellet has an initial temperature of 75.8 degrees Celsius. It is dropped into 193 grams of water, originally at 27.1 degrees Celsius. The final temperature of both the copper pellet and the water is 50.3 degrees Celsius. What's the heat capacity of the metal? And just in case you don't remember it from the previous problem, heat capacity of liquid water is provided there for you. So I'm gonna pause the recording for a minute. All right, let's go over this one. Again, organization is the key, right? Keeping your data organized helps prevent math errors because the math's not hard. There's just a lot of numbers that you're juggling here. So that means that the water will be our system and the, excuse me, the water will be our surroundings, the metal will be our system. So the water's gonna gain, metal's gonna lose. So we keep all of our data organized. And now we do the arithmetic. So we're just plugging into MC delta T for the water is equal to negative MC delta T of the metal. And I'm gonna do the arithmetic. I came out with 13.1 joules per gram degree Celsius. Did you? Three significant figures here. And let's do this one. Why don't you try this one? A student is doing a calorimetry experiment using hot water and cold water, right? So in other words, both the system and the surroundings here are water. One's hot water, one's cold water. So you need to decide which one's which. Beaker A contains 50 grams of water at 94 degrees Celsius. Beaker B contains 100 grams of water at 25 degrees Celsius. When the student mixes the two beakers, what will the final temperature be when thermal equilibrium is achieved? Thermal equilibrium means what? They're at the same temperature. And let's just for the sake of sig figs, let's put a decimal after those two so it's got more than one significant figure. Unpause. Here we go. So the cold water will gain heat. Right, and the hot water will lose heat because heat is going to go from hot to cold. Right, so that means the cold water will have the positive Q and the hot water will have the negative Q. Yes, and so now we're just keeping track of our data again. We put sig figs, right? We put a decimal there and a decimal there to help with sig figs. So notice they have the same final temperature, and that's what we're solving for, right. So they have the same x. This x is the same as this x. Yes. So now when we plug in, right, 100 times 4.184 times x minus 250 equals 50 times 4.184 times x minus 94. Right. So you're solving for Tf is going to be the same for both, both substances, right? So this times this comes out here. This times this comes out here. Right, and now we're gonna distribute this times this and this times this goes down here. This times this and this times this. All right, so we're doing a little bit of algebra. So we distribute, distribute. Now we're gonna combine like terms, 
right? So we're gonna get all the TFs together, all the numbers together. So that means 48 degrees Celsius, which we would need three, two sig figs, right? If we put, if we put a decimal here and a decimal here, that would mean our final answer can only have two sig figs, not three. So everyone see how we did this arithmetic? It's just using the distributive property and then combining like terms. So not too bad in terms of algebra. The part that gets you into trouble is watching where you plug in your numbers, right? That's the hardest part of this. So that's where we're gonna stop for today. On Wednesday, we'll talk about changing state.